Now, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Hans Reinders. Um, I want it, it's kind of providential that you all who led the meditation this morning used a section from Psalm 139, because Psalm 139 was a loose framework for the organization of a feshrift that I and another colleague of Hans's in the Netherlands helped arrange for him for his official retirement from the Free University. And I will tell you that it is one of the biggest accomplishments of my life that we did that, not necessarily because of the quality of the Feshrift, but because his wife, Lydia, got us to do it, and he didn't know about it until we presented it to him. So we were, in fact, able to keep it secret, and, uh, and it was a surprise to him uh, to do that. But it was loosely organized around Psalm 139, and I want to read just one paragraph from the foreword that I did for that. Hans Reinders, one who has contributed so much to so many as professor, author, teacher, colleague, friend, as well as fellow searcher and disciple. One might say that Hans has made a career out of frustrating and challenging many of our assumptions about what we think we know about theology, ethics, sciences, ourselves, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and the very ways we go about knowing and being known. Thereby, he has shown light on our common searches for the ways everlasting, as in the psalm, as well as deeper understandings of our others and ourselves. In a world so full of its assumptions about how we know others and ourselves through fact, intellect, and assumptions about truth, Hans has reminded us time and time again that relationships, friendships, and mystery are foundational to our search, both at the beginning and at the end. My beginning of relationships with Hans was at an IAS, IASSID meeting. If you don't know what that stands for, it's the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual Disabilities, a horrible name, uh, but, but it, that's, I asked it, it sounds like you're taking a drug trip to go there. Uh, uh, but the, uh, it's the international group that does this, and one of the things that struck, and when I first met him, and been one of our qualities, I think, through our relationship, has been that Hans and I have spent a major amount of our time working on the secular side. Of, of services and supports, trying to help people there understand spiritual and theological issues and the ways that they manifest themselves in lives and in services. Um, uh, that, that continued uh, in many ways, uh, in a variety of ways, uh, but the book, his first book, The Future of the Disabled and Liberal Society, if you have not read that, for me, is, was a linchpin uh, and a key part in helping for me to figure out some of the key issues, uh, theological issues, although not named as such, in the world of disability services and supports and in policy. He was at Princeton for a while. We did some wonderful work together with self-advocates and direct care professionals. Hans would do the theoretical stuff, and I'd come in with the pra practical and pastoral and tell stories. And it was a great a Mutt and Jeff team uh, working together in, a, in some times that I really appreciated. But it's been through the Institute that our collaboration and friendship has really deepened. Some of you who are new to the Institute and others may not have forgotten that the Institute essentially stopped, started in two crises. One crisis was that a grant proposal and the way I was working it out, a, a project in Pennsylvania, Turned out that it really didn't work very well the way I had envisioned it. And so rather than my going around to seminaries trying to help them do something around disability, we decided we'd try to bring the best people in the world together and see if we couldn't tempt people to come to us uh, at Gettysburg. And so we planned the first one with John and Eric and Amos Young and uh, Hans and others. And just before that, about three weeks, I went into my second round of a major clinical depression. Um, so Hans and John stopped by my house in Princeton and then went on to Gettysburg to be the MCs and to keep and to get this thing off the ground 
uh, for this first time in the midst of that crisis, a act of generosity and friendship and colleagueship for which I am ever grateful. We recorded those sessions, uh, uh, audio recording. You got the audio recording yesterday from the Second Institute. And after I came out of that later on the summer and listened to that recording, I said, wow, this was really good. Uh, uh, the original 35 people, and so we said, let's do it again. And so we did it again. And the next year it was 85, and then continued to move and to grow and to get support from a variety of different places. But to have colleagues and a friend to step in in a moment like that, uh, to carry the load that I could not carry at that, at that point, uh, for me speaks of true friendship. And I think probably Hans has been my closest confidant about the Institute over the years uh, and uh, been just a person who helped us think together. He had started the, the uh, PhD symposium, which has had such an impact. And we are both so delighted to see other people come and care, coming and carrying on the torches and contributing not our light, but their own and bringing new ways of seeing and believing and belonging into the world. So I introduce to you again this morning, Hans Reinders. I'm really interested to hear what he said because the first 10 years of the Institute, I think were shaped by many people who were shaped by Jean Vanier and Larch. And COVID brought a radical change in terms of that, not just because of COVID, but because of the revelations. And uh, Hans, we welcome you to come and help us think through that. Hans Reinders, everyone. Thank you, Bill, for this um, wonderful introduction, um, which expresses exactly how I have been experienced the time that you had described. Um, welcome to you all. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again after missing, I think, one or two institute meetings in the last uh, years. And you know what happens if, that, uh, if that's the case? As soon as you not show up, people start to change things, <laughs> even without asking permission. <laughs> and one of the things that has changed is that I learned and uh, learned also to see it as appropriate that people start with not only introducing themselves, but part of the direction, describe what they look like. Now, I'm a theo theologian and a philosopher, and I have to admit a bit of a reflective mind. And I know for a fact, and you do know for a fact, that if you asked 100 people to describe somebody, you will get 100 different descriptions. They, they will overlap sometimes, but they do not necessarily completely overlap. This, the question is, how do I describe myself? Um, there is an easy way to solve that. We just asked all of you, well, tell me who is this guy standing in front of you, but that takes all of my time, so I won't do that. Um, so let's just try me sitting there looking at this guy and then tell you what I see. Um, the let me see whether this is correct. Let me skim the, the room very, very quickly. Yes, I'm the only guy wearing a jacket in this room. <laughs> well, that doesn't help. Well, it's absolutely true. It doesn't help the people uh, for, we who, for whom we have to introduce this practice. Not a bit, of course. Uh, so the jacket I wear, it's not only a jacket, but we also wear a vest. Uh, the one is, what is it? It's a little bit of apricot, but it's old. It's the color is sort of a bit nondescriptive. Uh, my jacket is dark blue, as are my uh, trousers. Um, I like to be formally dressed, but not too formally. So I do not wear a tie, but otherwise it's, um, Oh, and of course, what I should, I do not wear glasses. One of the things that I noticed from people who previously were uh, presenting themselves what they look, um, the two persons were wearing glasses, which he didn't mention, but I 
but I immediately notice, oh, that's curious if you presenting yourself to people who have uh, uh, visual problems, that this is a thing that I would be interested in knowing. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what people are interested in knowing about me. I know I'm bold. <laughs> I would like, I would love, uh, like Eric, to describe the color of my hair, but I do not have much, and what it has is just white, so it's not very... Um, okay. As far as views are concerned, this is who I am, at least today. Um, I will... Oh, there you go. Um, and, and Masters is just reminding me that I didn't mention my beard. I also have a beard. Do you have a name for this kind of beard, Anne? Okay, well, there you go. Um, I'm. <laughs> okay. Um, I will speak to you this morning about um, a project that I got started, must have been about two years ago, uh, when we were chewing about this horrible news about our friend and in many ways, um, spiritual mentor is perhaps too strong, but at, le at least the person who we uh, learned a lot from uh, in this field, Jean Vanier. Um, to be very quick on that, the project results in a book uh, that will be published in, I think, in the fall. Um, it will be published by Cascade. It's a, it's a division of Rip and Stock, and it's called the betrayal of Wit the, the betrayal of witness: reflections on the downfall of Jean Vanier. Uh, it has uh, a collection of essays with various people among uh, the authors. Various people are among uh, are in this room this morning, um, and it's. Um, it's an attempt to sort of reflect on what this means, uh, the, 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 the news and the revelations about his sexual transgressions and abuse. Um, it's, it's edited together, I edited it together with Stan Howas, and we decided to leave uh, the authors fairly free in what they wanted to address. So there wasn't this kind of an agenda, so you, this is for you, this is for you, and this is for you. And of course, that meant also that we left people free in the motivation, in their motivation of why they would like to contribute. So in that regard, I can only speak for myself. So, though, so what was it? Um, and I think the term I would, would like to use is uh, responsibility. Now, of course, there are various ways of thinking about responsibility. Uh, one is widely used, but isn't very exciting. Uh, it's the responsibility that comes with your office or with your task, or uh, for which you can say, I'm responsible for this and that. But if you wouldn't say it, somebody else would point out it's your responsibility because they come with your work. That's not the point here. The point is, and I, I strongly felt that after the first revelations came out in February 2020. How do, how do I take responsibility for what I wrote about this guy? And it seemed to me appropriate for me to ask that question. I haven't done the count, but it's absolutely certain that I've been writing about 150 pages about him. And if you would add the novel that I did about him, you would even have much more. Um, so. The reason why I'm here today and giving these reflections is um, that I want to hold myself accountable for what I said about him in order to be able, or at least to try, to assess which of these things I would I say again and which of these things would I think, well, that might have been pretty naive. 
uh, given what came out as truth. Um, now, in order not to leave the impression, I was an admirer and in some ways a friend. I met him a couple of times. We were visiting Trolley a couple of times. To Trolley, France, that's where Jean lived with his com community. But in order to do not, uh, do not to leave the impression that I take in any way lightly or want to, to brush over what happened, I will start with the findings of a committee that was inaugurated after the first uh, report came out. The per first report, as I said, was 2020 in February, and it, uh, it said that there had been accusations by six women about sexual transgression and abuse by Fanier and the authorities of large, large international that received these, uh, these complaints and messages have been looking at them and took them to be trustworthy and therefore they brought it out in the open. Uh, but of course, the, the, the stories themselves, which they sort of were not, not fully published, but the facts were, and so uh, they decided to install a study committee in order to look what is, what's, what's the story behind this? Uh, what led to this? What, what's the, and how, in what way is, was Fanier uh, uh, culpable of these practices? And um, the reason why, which we originally hoped to do to present the book here, and the reason why that couldn't, uh, uh, why that wouldn't work out was, that the final report of this study committee came only out in last January. So and then the time was just too short to reconsider what we wrote in advance and have the book published in time. Um, and the committee was, um, the, the, the findings of the committees were absolutely horrible. There's no, there's no way, other word for it. Um, it didn't add, it didn't add much in terms of, there were much more women uh, than might, but that was not the point of the committee. The committee's research laid out that the well-known beginnings of the history of Lars were, at least in one particular sense, a complete sham. Um, I could go on for an hour about this, but I won't, but I try to be brief and quick. Um, the key person in the early history of Lars and the years before were even more important. The Lars started in, in 1964. In the years before, there was a, a, a history related to a place in, in, uh, in the south of Paris, Auvive, which was a kind of a retreat center for spiritual formation and it had a director, which was also, who was also uh, Fanier's spiritual mentor, by the name of Thomas Philippe. I have to confess, I'm not a Roman Catholic, which probably explains why I have a hell of a problem calling this guy father, but he was a father. He was Father Thomas Philippe. Uh, but he didn't seem like one, at least not to me. Um, and Thomas Philippe came in Fanier's life actually through his mother. His mother had uh, uh, Thomas Philippe, he was a Dominican, a French Dominican. He was a professor of theology. He was not a, he was not a, not a small guy. Uh, and his mother, Fanier's mother had, um, Fanier is from a well-to-do, distinguished Canadian family. His father was governor of C Canada, which is, a modern version of the old Viceroy, I think. So it was re really important, uh, a very important family. And his mother had, uh, had come to know uh, Thomas Philippe and took him as a spiritual guide. And so did Fanier. But Philippe was, um, as the committee uh, discovered and sort of brought to, to light for the public, I was um, a strange uh, thinking theologian who managed to mix up mystical theology with a kind of eroticism that made most of us, when we saw it first, just shudder. So how can you, how is that possible to, 
to think this way. And to just briefly indicate what that was about, he describes that in the mid-30s, he was and then teaching in Rome um, as a professor, he was in front of uh, a, a, a picture of Mary in a church. And he described how he had a very intimate connection with Mary, including sexual activity. And he sort of brought that into a, 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 a theological language, which resulted in the, fact, in, in, in the claims that the mystical union of the believer with God, with the deity, which of course in Christianity could mean with the son uh, and also with the mother, uh, that uh, the mystical union also not only was a spiritual reality, but was a physical reality as well. So the distinction between the two was completely gone. Um, that was the main thing about Fournier's spiritual guide. And so, um, but none of us, not that all of this wasn't known. At least it wasn't known by people like us who, 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 were known, uh, who, who did know Lars and did know Fournier's writing. It was known at least to some extent by the leadership of the Dominican order. And it was also known by the Vatican because there had been official procedures to, uh, 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 to condemn, um, investigate and then condemn uh, um, this man, uh, Thomas Philippe. Um, and he was sent out of his office, he was actually sent out of the country. But what the committee, and that was entirely new, what the committee found was that Jean was among the leading people trying to maintain illegal connections with Thomas Philippe. And in order to make that work, and it, that was not only, he had a circle of people included, and included men and women, uh, half a dozen, I guess, uh, who had this strange uh, mystical, erotical theology, if you can call it that, or, that at all. Um, and, but what the committee sort of clearly established, at least in my view, was that in order to be able to maintain these contacts and, and sort of continue their practices uh, of sexual trans transgression, they found illegal ways of staying in contact with Thomas Philippe. And one of the ways that showed, for example, uh, the, and the report of the committee has the, the, the testimony, they had coded letters writing in which you could not know whom was whom and whom was talking about whom, but it was absolutely clear that that was not, uh, that was not kosher, so to speak. And um, what happened is that they decided uh, after a couple of years when, the, the, when Thomas Philippe was allowed to come back, they decided to look for a place where they could have their spiritual practices, and that became large. So uh, if anybody reading that stuff would say, okay, so the history of the beginning of Lars, as we know it, just as a sham, I think the answer would be yes. Um, so that leaves the question, what was so inspirational about this man in the first place? Um, well, it was not just accidental, but when the Institute started in 2010, there were at least uh, a number of us uh, who were very much inspired by Vanier. Uh, John would be the first to mention, myself uh, included, uh, Bill, um, um, uh, some of the others as well, in more or less. Uh, and some of us had been at Trolley at a conference by, organized by the Templeton Foundation, and Bill was there, uh, John was there, Stan Howard was there. And it was about responding from academia to Vanier, and the, the book that came out is The Paradox of Disability, I think. So we were, we were in our thinking, 
uh, inspired by, uh, by this man and what he had done. Uh, and the question is, why is that? What was the source of the inspiration? Um, I think to indicate what that was, I will quote Bill. It's a, in, in, uh, it's a one-liner that he often used. I think he got it from one of his spiritual heroes, the true hero, <laughs> Parker Palmer. And the line is, because we do not know how to build relationship, we rely on compliance. That for me was one line that said exactly why I thought most of what people in, 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 the, in the field were pursuing, including progressive service providers, wasn't exactly what I thought needed to be done. And uh, mind you, I'm talking about the field of intellectual disabilities solely. Uh, and that's an, that's an important distinction, this connection. Um, and to just to indicate a little, uh, a, a little bit of what my uh, uh, various war, war is to say, you only pursue the importance of autonomy in a society that is known for its way of regulating people's lives. That's why you invent autonomy as the power, as the spiritual power, as the moral power to go against that and break those rules where they are simply oppressive and the arrangements and the institutional practices to break them down. Um, but my sense was always it starts something else, some, somewhere else because even if we would manage uh, to quote that new, the new vision of the late 80s and so on, uh, and after that, even if we would manage to rearrange our social institutions in a way that would allow people with intellectual disabilities to fully participate, they still might be wanting the most important thing in their lives. And I know that because I've asked them dozens and dozens and dozens of times that question. If you could, if you had the option of being a student and a tenant, uh, owning a business, uh, having a paid job, or having a friend, what would you choose? The answer was always the same. Because uh, an autonomous life doesn't give you a friend. It might, but it, there are other things and other th practices and other things needed in order for, to have uh, to have friends in your life. So I, fr I coined the phrase, and that was what I've been working on mainly in, at least in those years. I coined the phrase, people with intellectual disabilities are seldomly, bl seldomly blessed with the fact that they are chosen by others to become their friends. Um, and friendship was the key term not only in, in Vanier's thinking about his connection with people with intellectual disabilities, but you felt it everywhere if you, as soon as you would, would step into a, a, a large community, um, whether it would be in England or in the States or in Holland or Belgium or wherever, you would sense this is truly a communion of friendship. So that was what, what connected us. Uh, with the idea of Lars, that if you, if you see people with intellectual disabilities being much less appreciated than their potential uh, would warrant, then uh, one response is, okay, let's change the institutions, and that's a very important response, and we've always been supportive of it. But it's a limited approach because it has limited agents. You need for institutional change, you need governments, you need, you need policy makers. And that's exactly the limitations because governments and policy makers and laws are not going to provide you with friends. That was sort of the, 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 the heart of the matter, I think. Um, to expand a little bit on that is the question, how did Fanier then become, um, and how did, how did he, as I said, Fournier has 
inspired us in similar, but we have been doing different things with, with the legacy. And I want to talk a little bit of, about my, um, my way of trying to make sense of what he did and to, to extend it and, and work with it. When I started in the field of intellectual disability, I didn't know of any. <clears throat> Uh, it was in the mid 80s and I was talking to people. I have, I did not come to uh, a self-advocacy organization that just had begun to start in that time. That only happened a few years later. I started because I visited the places. I was invited to, uh, I won't go over why that was, but there were events and in, in, in scandals in the media that sort of made ethics something that you wanted to think about. And that's why I uh, appeared there. And um, looking at, at, also looking at the literature and looking where that was going, um, I got the strong sense that um, if people with intellectual disabilities suffer, they rarely suffer from their disability but they mostly suffer from the responses they get from other people. Uh, in that sense, I was, even before I knew the extensive literature, I was, a, a, uh, I was a friend of the social model of disability because, I mean, I saw it every day if I were spending time with people with intellectual disabilities. Um, but then I started to think about this whole new approach, the new vision um, from, um, from rights, from beneficence to rights was one, one of those titles. Um, so instead of thinking about the ethics of caring for people and supporting people with disabilities in terms of, of benevolence and beneficence, th that's not what you want. You do not want to make people dependent on other people's goodwill. You want to, you, them to have rights because they are strong, they are firm. But particularly from the angle of thinking about people with intellectual disabilities, and especially people with profound uh, intellectual disabilities, the question is, is this, really, is this really now finally the vision that liberates people from all sorts of limiting uh, preconceptions and finally allows them, enables them to shape their own life. Uh, for many people with disabilities it was and still is and I would never ever dreaming, dreaming of doing something else than support it, but it was not for all. For parts of the disability world the new vision was not just the next version of other people telling them who, how to think about their lives, namely as an autonomous person. Um, and so, and it struck me, instead of, of, of what the new vision sort of professed, it struck me, and I, then I started to look at the history of intellectual disabilities and I noticed that in each epoch, in each era, <clears throat> you, kind of, you could find traces that the view, the predominant view of how, we, how people looked at people's, uh, persons with intellectual disabilities, was an exact mirror of how people in that era understood themselves. Um, and I thought, well, why should that not be true of the vision that we now sort of are uh, proposing in terms of uh, the pursuit of individual rights as the way to their liberation. Um, so, the, 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 the question that comes up, if you, has, if you have, uh, if you've been thinking about these things, how in the world did Fanier end up being a sexual abuser? How did that, how did that happen? What was it? Um, and again, it here was the inspiration and his cooperation with the Thomas Philippe, an important thing. But there was something else that is uh, important to mention in this connection, and that it was. Um, if you look at the way these people describe themselves, 
and what they avowed as core values for which they, they wanted to stand. They would, you would find words like uh, humility, uh, smallness. These were the kinds of, uh, they had, the, Philippe had a name, nickname for, for his flock, Tout Petit, the little ones. And uh, that was not referring to people with disabilities, that was re referring to themselves. And that was, in a way, uh, meant to be opposing things like pomp and pride that were always descri ascribed to persons representing authority within the church. So one of the things that, that appears from this report is that this group was opposing the official church and its regulations. And I do not want to go too far into that, but it reminds me, and when we um, think about, we are talking about the turn of, uh, of the, no, no, at the mid of the century, uh, in the 20th century. It reminds me of intellectual movement in that, uh, at that time in the society who were brightly, broadly spread and who did look at institutional arrangements as limiting, not as empowering. So uh, uh, the catchword, of course, uh, from the point of philosophy would be existentialism. The, the real, the truth about your own, your own life exists is something that you do with your own, in your own self, in your own mind, and you do not depend for that on larger social structures. Um, and so that meant that, theologically speaking, the true Christian existence is an existence that is not limited by official teaching, by official regulation. It's, it's, reg it's, it's a, an existence that is only uh, about to find the unity with the spirit. And this resulted in something that I didn't know and learned from this report, and I think was very significant. Fournier wrote a dissertation. He was a trained philosopher. And he wrote a dissertation on Aristotle's ethics, but mainly the question that interested him, what is, it, what is it to be a good Christian person? And he went through all the sorts of debates that I just was briefly indicating. But the important thing was, there was an unwritten, there was an unpublished part to the dissertation only handwritten, and that part sort of opened my eyes really, oh, so this was going on. And what it said is, well, um, there have always been two kinds of Christian morality. One for the people, for the laity, for the, for the no, uh, he didn't use that phrase, but I, for the normal people, for the, for the, for the people in the pew. Uh, and then you have a morality for the people who really understand what Christian faith is about. He even said, for the saints. Um, uh, one of the contributors, this is right the right moment to mention that, one of the contributors to the book is, is Keith. And Keith has this wonderful uh, paper that say, against living saints, well, this is, would be the reason why uh, you would argue against living saints. If this is the presupposition that Christian morality has these two components, uh, one for ordinary people like all of us, I would say, and one for the specially blessed. And of course, that was a self-designated <laughs> role uh, that, they, that they chose. And it was the role that enabled, uh, for example, Thomas Philippe, uh, to say, well, um, if you have received these graces, these graces from, uh, from, from Mary and from Jesus, you, it carries you beyond the confines of ordinary morality, which meant the teachings of the church. And so they considered themselves to be utterly free, more free than anybody. And so that, uh, that, I think, was the main explanation, at least to me, made the most sense, okay, this is 
what enabled them to think they, go, they could go this way. An interesting question, and I think there's time to uh, finish up. An interesting question is, of course, and keeps in my mind going, uh, Fanier has not been reported uh, to have abused people with intellectual disabilities. Um, there are traces in the report where you find, it's, it's a collection of authors, different disciplines, each, each having a chapter from his or her own discipline. And there are traces where you think, mm, some of these people have been really mad and they think the entire story of Lars was a sham. Translated into uh, philosophical terms, I would say that that would be that would amount to the view that Lars was a cover-up that was purely instrumental to the continuations of criminal practices, namely sexual transgression and abuse of by men of women. It's more complicated than that, but let's for the moment uh, keep it at that. Um, so. Um, but then I ask, okay, consider, suppose that's true. Um, then the question, why would have Fournier stopped with these women and not abuse people with intellectual disability? Why, why, why would that be? Um, and another question, equally relevant is, does this mean that all the people who have been in touch with him, like many of us uh, are, have been, have they all been deluded, not seeing what this guy was really doing? Uh, I've been watching him in, uh, together with people with intellectual disabilities in Trudeau, in, in Trolley, doing a service on, on, on each, each afternoon at, at six. And it, it doesn't really get into my mind that that was all fraud. So then the question is, okay, what, what has been going on exactly at this point? And I think that's, and that's um, the final point. There is a hypothesis that's explicitly stated in the, in the report uh, that says there is, a dis there is a difference between how uh, this man, Thomas Philippe, talks about his work and life with people with disabilities, who he has always was also engaged in that, uh, and how Fournier talks about it. And I, 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 my hypothesis is Fournier was, despite all the wrong things he did, but he was st still more moved by uh, a desire for a community than Philippe was. Um, I do not know whether that's true, but it makes sense, it helps to make sense to see that it's very rare, it's very difficult to think that all of his life was just uh, a way to all, only to delude us. And finally, the one reason at least that for me is pretty persuasive is to say I've been um, among people with intellectual, intellectual disabilities long enough to know you cannot fool them about what you, what you really mean. If I would be a fraud, they would be the first to feel that. They have been around him for years and years and years and they would not have felt that the man is a fraud. I find that hard to believe. Uh, but many of these questions will probably never get an answer. Thank you. All right, stay up, but let's see if there are some questions or responses that people would like to have. Questions or responses? Uh, Justin? You're, you're you got a bright sun behind you, so I can't see your face. Johns, come up here. <clears throat> 
so my book was published about nine months prior to the um, unveiling of these uh, tragic events or circumstances. And um, I really wrestled with taking a, a Sharpie and blacking out that entire section on Vanier in which I was fairly laudatory, but but in there, uh, because I studied under somebody who is experienced with the Korean, I believe, concept of Han, which loosely translates to collective pain, I, I question whether Vanier dealt, dealt with his own pain in his own life well, and that bled over into some of his larger interactions. I, I don't know if you know this, but has there been work reflecting on uh, the lack of boundaries and the lack of processing of his own pain that may have led to uh, uh, some of these circumstances, which is also a great concern of mine as a spiritual director and counselor. That's a broad question, and you may not yeah. know the answer, but I'm looking for a place to start. Yeah. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, that is a very, that is a very uh, relevant question, of course. Um, perhaps I should mention that um, what attracted me first in Vanier was exactly at this point. Maybe I said that I worked, I worked from the conviction that if people with disabilities suffer, they suffer from other people's responses, which of course raises the question, okay, what accounts for other people's responses? And in Fournier's work, I found a kind of the, 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 the psychological answer to this question, which is exactly as she pointed out. Namely, well, it may be the case that I need to be strong, I need to be condescendent, partly to hide my insecurity. Many people are as afraid as hell for people with intellectual disabilities. And why is that? Because what is it that I'm sort of, they touch you, they, they do anything that you are sort of, they do not have a sense of your personal circle. They do absolutely not understand, at least many of them, what intimacy is. And so uh, uh, one of the ways in which the responses apparently work is just to keep the distance. And the distance is kept by creating this distance. I am here and you are there. And that's not only outsiders within the world of disability, that in itself is a frequently seen phenomenon. Even, even in, 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 in many official descriptions you find, okay, people with intellectual disabilities are here, meaning uh, uh, the institutions of service providers, group homes, whatever, because there are certain things they cannot do for themselves and therefore it's our responsibility to do it for them. Even if they don't use the language us and them and for them, then still it is the same. There is something coming from me that is what uh, answering to their needs and that's the reason why I do what I do. The mechanism is still the power difference. Fanier therefore just laid it out that this is the main problem. And what struck me as why I sort of thought, oh, this is the place where I look at uh, the, the large community. Because it tells you that there are many young people coming as volunteers to large communities. And nine of ten, out of 10 arrive there with the notion that they want to do something good for the world. And the, the leadership of large says, that's the first thing we ought to, talk, to, to tell them not to want. Because if I want to do something good for, for you, 
your response is going to be one that leaves you the possibility to either accept what I think is good for you or, or become a very, very angry person and then the, 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 the support worker cannot do anything good. So, um, so, so that working with your own pain and with your own uh, wounds and history was a really important thing in Fournier's, uh, in Fournier's reflections. Now whether that he ultimately succeeded in doing that for himself, I have, I wouldn't otherwise mention it, but I have written a novel about Fournier, it's called The Second Calling. The, the story is this, Fournier wanted, did want to write me, asked me to write a book about Lars, and I said, you've written all the stuff I could think of, so why? Now it should be for younger people. And I guess you are a little bit closer to younger people than I am. So yeah, yes, that's probably true. <laughs> but um, I was, and I tried it to work and it, I was, it was, I finally decided to create a story. And the story is about a guy who starts a community and, it's, and one of the community's members is a pretty severe a uh, young uh, woman, and she is hard to handle because she is a f she's like a bird, she flitters all the time. And the only workshop they have is a pottery, and so she smashes all the things that people are working on. So it's absolutely impossible to sort of, to, to have her there, but they nonetheless, some of them know what, what to do. And this guy himself occasionally steps in to, to, to do a shift, and she drives him crazy. And it ends with that he becomes violent at her. And that is a story that I got from, from Fournier's own life because that is exactly what happened with him. And the reason for bringing it up is we, we came at his house with the manuscript and he pulled it, it's a novel. I said, yeah, I can't help it, it's a novel. And I got a message um, two weeks later, an email, read the book. I was very moved, period. And I said, okay, that's, I, I remember physically, I thought, okay, there are things you do not want me to tell me. And I think it was about what you're indicating. I'm not sure whether we have, whether we ever get the resources and the files and the archives in order to be able to answer this question. We have two uh, comments coming through on the chat from people who are joining us uh, virtually. The first comes from uh, Rabbi Rudy Reagan, who um, says, I read the report, and it seems to me that they did not meaningfully investigate whether Vanier or his disciples abused disabled people. As far as I can tell, very few disabled core members were interviewed and none uh, of the interviews involved, interviewers involved had expertise in interviewing people with cognitive and or communication disorders. So it seems to me that we don't actually know one way or another how far this went. Uh, there's a general sense of, Hans, is there anything that you would like to add to that um, to respond to? No, only, that, only to say that it's not for nothing that what I just told you is called an hypothesis meaning we don't have proof for the either, for, for either of one possibilities. Um, as it stands, she's absolutely right. Uh, in the sense that depending on other voices that may come up, but thus far they didn't. And um, it's, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it, but uh, the level of sexual abuse in the world of intellectual disability is huge. It's uh, the, the figures that I know for a number of years ago and they relate to the Netherlands, 60% of all people have experienced some kind of abuse. Um, I would be surprised if that would be kept completely silent, but the strict answer is yes, he's right. The second online question we have comes from Jennifer Jordan and she says, I have a question 
I work in a group home community that used to start every morning with Vanier reading. Now we do nothing prayerful at all. How may others be reckoning in this way? Hmm. Can you expand a little bit on the last sentence? Because I do not really, my English is not just that I think, what's the reckoning in this connection? Um, Jennifer, do you have access to audio? Would you like to augment? Question for Hans. It might just more be more of a question for other people in these positions of, of working. Um, I guess it's sort of like, who is the replacement? Um, I think some people have, you know, he, he's been another person who's been disappointing in faith. And, and then that ends or has, at least where I work, uh, kind of ended faith as, as part of the inspiration for the work we do. Thank you. So it doesn't, okay, I get it. Um, doesn't this strike you as a way to reverse the roles of the message and the messenger? Uh, I would not know why you would stop praying or thinking about your inspiration or your face simply because this guy defrauded you. That's, I, that's easily put, but I know it's, it, many people have been deeply hurt. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, losing not only a friend, but apparently belonging to the world that was useful because everything we wrote and did it for the good name of Lars. Uh, but I, I would not for a minute consider these, these, these events and the transgression and the crimes be a reason stop uh, trying to express the same convictions and feelings and values. The messenger doesn't kill the message, I would say. We have time for one more question right here, and then we'll wrap up. Hi. Um, actually, I'm here actually for this meeting <laughs> because uh, 10 years before, I was very inspired from John Wenyan. And uh, I'm from Buddhist background, and uh, somehow, I feel I understand him many ways, and I'm a woman, so I can speak. <laughs> because if, if a man, maybe it's very hard to speak about that, because man is in the position powerful, right? So then there's a, this kind of order, authority. So my thought is whether we need to understand from spiritual point of view and recognize the soul being, like whether human is a soul and the body and the biggest things. So my understanding about John Van Nam, possibly he is also seeking on the way. And then he, so one thing is about intention. Intention, I think, whether he have like evil intention or he just trying to do what he believed he was doing good. That's something I would like to ask everybody to think about that because I really feel somehow we're starting to criticize everybody. And then, like the whole world, right, the Me Too things, I do feel sorry for women, and because I'm a woman, I understand. But then I just feel whether we're also forgetting those forgiving and the protection and the forgiving. This word is relatively. So I don't know like, whether people want to seeking understanding or seeking judgment. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. A, yeah. I get your point. Um, it's kind of um, it's it's kind of what uh, a number of people were thinking in the beginning. That is, after the first uh, news came out in 2020. But if you read this report, one thing that stand out is the cleverness with which this group of people. Uh, were acting in duplicity. 
They were hiding themselves. They were using code language. They absolutely knew that what they did was not easy to justify. So they, it's, it's, there, is, there is a way of doing bad things in good faith. But what, what the investigation brought up doesn't look like doing bad things in good faith. Even though, perhaps, that's the final, even though Fournier has never admitted that he was sexually transgressing or abusing uh, people. He, d he never has admitted. He has, he has refused that language and thought there were a few reports about uh, a husband from one of the women that was originally uh, making this, this, this charge. And he said the husband is overreacting. So he had absolutely no feeling what was uh, going on at the time. But then that this, this report came with that earlier story and they were just acting like a gang. I think that's an adequate word in this connection. Cool. So they're acting like a cult. I think going back to Justin's thing, one of the tragedies for me was that he talked a lot about the woundedness of everybody, but he couldn't talk about his own, and and <coughs> and or bring that to a community in some way. Um, but we need to move on. There'll be time for more conversation with Hans, uh, and uh, thank you, Hans, again. Uh, uh, you were the one to come and help us think through this in some ways, and. It's one of the, your thing about the two different moralities of the people who are supposedly the saints uh, is uh, there are way too many examples of that in Protestant Christianity as well, and uh, and it just gives you one pause. Uh, so thank you very much. Let's take a break and be back at eleven. Thank you.